This presentation on mindfulness is hosted by Susquehanna University Counseling Center. My name is Melissa Frame and I'm a counselor. Why mindfulness? Well, we know that there is so much that we are dealing with, just all kinds of uncertainty and anxiety currently with the global pandemic. And just in general, mindfulness is something that can not only help us manage that, but also navigate all the challenges throughout our lives. So let's take a look at why. Um, first of all, mindfulness is something that helps reduce the symptoms of many different physical and mental health conditions, including anxiety and depression, which are the most common mental health disorders uh, from which people suffer and struggle. Mindfulness helps us improve our ability to focus our attention, certainly useful for college students as well as faculty and staff. Uh, helps us enhance our productivity, and best of all, increases our life satisfaction. This is just a bit of an introduction about stress and anxiety. Um, so what happens when we get stressed? Well, our bodies are pretty clever, and we have evolved over eons to help keep ourselves safe. So what happens is that when our brains sense danger, the limbic system in our brain regulates hormones to help us respond to that crisis or trauma. And this is a wonderful thing to have happen if we've got a saber-toothed tiger approaching. What happens is that our old reptilian brain, that amygdala at the base of our skull, that takes over and it just brings our prefrontal cortex right offline. And our prefrontal cortex is where we do all of our higher order rational thinking. And this is great because if a tiger's coming, we don't want to have some kind of debate with ourselves about whether I should run or climb a tree or just freeze and pretend that I'm dead. We just want to act. We need to do something immediately. Um, but the other thing that happens is that if stress and anxiety escalate to a high enough threshold, we can experience things that are not true danger situations as if they are true emergencies. And that is the difficulty, that if we are so stressed and so anxious that something like an exam or writing a paper can feel to our bodies as horrible as if we're about to get attacked by a saber-toothed tiger. So will lead into how mindfulness helps us with this. Now what's fight, flight, or freeze? When we sense danger, our bodies typically are gonna go into one of these three responses. We may wanna fight that saber-toothed tiger, we may wanna run away, that's the flight part, or we may freeze. And just an interesting side point, this, this is actually quite an adaptive thing that can happen. If, if you think about, say, a bunny who is being stalked by a wolf, if the bunny goes into freeze mode and the wolf picks up the rabbit thinking that it's dead, brings it back to its den, deposits the rabbit, and leaves to go hunt for other food, then after the wolf leaves, the bunny can kind of shake itself awake and escape. And an, an extraordinarily high percentage of prey animals escape their pred predators through the freeze response. So um, it, that, I just think that's fascinating. So what happens when we go into fight, flight, or freeze? Well, as we know, because our prefrontal cortex has gone offline, we can't concentrate. We can't think rational, rationally because fear and emotion is coursing through our system. Our thoughts are racing. Um, and long-term, we can experience changes in our appetite. We can experience mu muscle tension, sleep disturbance, and even panic attacks. So what? So what if I'm anxious? Well, this chart is interesting. This is based on the yerkes dodson Law and talks about the impact of anxiety on performance. And as you can see, as you look across this bell curve, if you have too little stress shown by the green area, then you're probably gonna to be too relaxed and laid back to really be productive. 
However, if you have a little bit more stress, the yellow area, that's actually an optimal level right in the center there because a little bit of stress or anxiety actually helps motivate us to perform at our peak. But then what happens is if we get too much stress, then we cross that tipping point right at the center of the bell curve. We edge over into that orange section where we're just on overload. We experience fatigue, we experience exhaustion. And then on a um, more extreme level, we may go all the way over to the red section where we're just burned out. We're experiencing anxiety, panic, perhaps anger, and just completely melt down. So this is just trying to demonstrate that a little bit of stress is a good thing, but too much actually inhibits our performance. So now the question is, how do I decrease my stress response? I know that I've been wired through evolution to have a stress response to help keep myself safe, but how do I overcome it when I'm dealing with a test or an assignment or a deadline and not a saber-toothed tiger? Well, the first thing that we can do is decrease our stress response with mindfulness and with breathing and relaxation exercises. So let's talk a little bit about breathing. Breathing activates our parasympathetic nervous system, and that's often referred to as our rest and digest system. That relaxes us. And the best way to breathe in order to engage the parasympathetic nervous system is to make sure that we're drawing our breath all the way down into our belly. And as you can see from the uh, clip art here, one way of really knowing whether or not you are bringing your breath all the way into your abdomen is to rest your hand or hands on your belly. And when you breathe in, notice and make an effort to bring that air all the way down so that your hand is actually rising and lifting with your belly. And then when you breathe out, your belly will move inward. Another thing that you'd wanna to do to help increase your, or rather decrease your stress, is to make your exhale a little bit longer than your inhale. So for example, you may wanna breathe in, two, three, four, and hold, and then out, two, three, four, five, six, hold, try it with me, in, two, three, four, and hold. Out, two, three, four, five, six. Hold once more. In, two, three, four, and hold. Out, two, three, four, five, six, hold. So just breathing just three times like that is often enough to help de-escalate that stress response. Another thing that we can do is uh, if you're able to breathe in through your no nose and then you can either breathe out through your mouth or through your nose. But you do want to make sure when you're breathing in that you're trying to do that through your nose. And pair that with guided imagery. That's another option. And there are all kinds of um, guided imagery uh, meditations available. And I'll talk about some of that at the end of the presentation. So now the question is, in addition to breathing, how, how can we be mindful? What does that really mean? Well, mindfulness is made up of three different components. Present moment awareness, non-judgment and acceptance, and self-compassion. And we'll talk about each of those. And in this uh, picture, you can see how a person is walking with their dog and the person's got a zillion things on their mind. I, I can't even understand all of them, but the car, maybe the garbage, somebody looks upset where are the socks in the laundry, there's music, there's just all kinds of things happening in this person's head. Uh, such 
to such an extent that it seems that they're not even seeing what's right in front of them. And then if you look at the dog who is in the moment, the dog is seeing what's right there, the trees, the sunshine. And that's just a great image for remembering. We want to be mindful, not have a full mind. And this is a lovely quote by Leo Buscalia. Worry never robs tomorrow of its sorrow. It only saps today of its joy. So how's that relevant? Well, because the first part that we mentioned is being in the moment. And oftentimes what happens is our bodies may exist in the present, but our brains are busy looking back and worrying about something in the past that already happened or looking to the future and worrying about things that could happen. But of course, we know we can't change the past. And the other thing is, when we think about the future and we worry about the future, sometimes we operate under the illusion that worrying helps prepare us. But in fact, it doesn't really prepare us so much as it just wears us out. So that if we worry and worry and worry about all these potential outcomes, then when something really does occur and that something is really challenging for us, it's far more difficult for us to have the energy and the wherewithal to face that challenge than if we had been existing and living and enjoying the present moment rather than worrying about what could or could not happen. So what does it mean to be in the moment? It means paying deliberate attention to what's going on around you, outside of you, and also within you. And one of the ways that we can do this is to engage all of our senses. And one thing you can do right now is um, the 54321 technique is a really simple grounding exercise. So first of all, look around you and name five things you can see. And then name four things that you can hear. Three things that you can touch. Two things that you can smell. One thing that you can taste. And you can do them in any order. It really doesn't matter. Um, but the by the time you get through that exercise and you've concentrated on noticing all the things around you using those five different senses and paying attention to how many of them you've marked off, you're no longer preoccupied with something that already happened or something that might happen in the future. You're really in the present moment. That's paying attention to what's around us. As far as paying attention to what's within us, that can be noticing how, how we're feeling, what emotions are going through us, and just being a witness to them. So maybe in this moment, I feel a little bit sad, or maybe I'm rejoicing at what's happening with the weather outside my window. It could be anything, but whatever it is, just paying attention to it, seeing it, and remarking it. The next part of it is non-judgment as well as acceptance, and we're going to start with non-judgment. So non-judgment means that we're suspending judgment and criticism. And remember that judgment is when we tend to label or evaluate things. We tend to label things as good or bad, right or wrong, things we should or should not do, things as terrible or wonderful, valuable or not. So Every time that we make a judgment and every time we give something a label, then we're putting more pressure, pressure on the consequences of what we do. So what happens is, let's say we get a poor grade on something. If we're constantly judging, then we can think things like, oh, I'm such a failure. I'm so stupid. And then that leads us to think the consequence of our being a failure or being stupid is that things are never going to get better. Whereas non-judgment allows us to consider things in really different ways. So let's say we get a poor grade, then maybe we can think, well, perhaps I didn't study enough or I didn't study the right things. 
And the consequence of that is, hey, hope's not lost. I can do something different next time I'm preparing for a test. And the overall um, piece here is that negativity gets reduced and healing and freedom can take place. So just being in non-judgment instead of labeling and judging our feelings and things that happen to us all the time. Now, the acceptance piece. Um, if you look at the picture here, you can see somebody went to the trouble of building a sand castle and oh dear, here comes the tide. So we could experience sadness, frustration, anger, that the tide is knocking down our sand castle. Or we could just accept the fact that the tide's going to come in and this is going to happen. And in fact, it is happening right now. So acceptance is about allowing the circumstances of our lives to be true without trying to take control or fight against them. And it also means understanding that we may not have the control to fulfill the desired outcome. Uh, this is very true oftentimes in relationships with friends or intimate partners. Maybe what we want more than anything is for the other person to understand us and want to be close to us. And yet that's not happening. And no amount of fighting against that truth is going to change the fact that that's what's occurring. And so part of acceptance is understanding that we may feel pain. We may feel very strong emotions in the moment. And yet then we can move forward. And finally, self-compassion. This is all about accepting ourselves as we are, choosing to love ourselves unconditionally, to stop judging ourselves. Um, most of us tend to judge ourselves very harshly. Every now and then folks will overestimate themselves, but that's less typical. If we really look at ourselves honestly, we can probably notice and acknowledge that we have wonderful characteristics and maybe some flawed ones too. And then another piece, and this one is really, really key. Another piece of self-compassion is recognizing that suffering truly is part of the shared human experience. It's not something that only happens to me and doesn't happen to anyone else. This is something that uh, is important because a lot of times when we're experiencing something difficult, we tend to feel that I'm the only one who's had to endure this and it's not fair and it's wrong and why me? It's okay not to like suffering. No one likes suffering. Um, Self-compassion is not about liking it. It's just about understanding that suffering is part of life, just as joy is part of life. So as a wrap up, remember that mindfulness is about being present and allowing experiences to be what they are. Acceptance is about agreeing to the circumstances of our lives instead of fighting against them. And self-compassion is about loving ourselves unconditionally. And some of the resources that we offer to help promote mindfulness from the Counseling Center are uh, we offer co-room mindfulness classes. Uh, we are offering yoga. We have the WellTrack app available. And once we're all back on campus, we can enjoy the Take Five Zones as well. So, thanks everybody and have a good day.